May what I say and what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. I've heard a lot of sermons on uh, this particular passage of John, and too many of them, the, the preachers make a big issue out of the different words for love that are exchanged between Jesus and Peter. Jesus asks Peter, do you agape me? And agape is the Greek word for not emotional love, but commitment. It's the rubber meets the road love. It's really profound commitment and the kind of follow through loving actions. When you think of Jesus' ministry and the things that he did, uh, we are seeing agape at work. We're seeing agape, of course, on the cross. Okay, so that's agape. Peter responds, uh, phileos, or phileo, um, which is a more emotional friendship type of love. But I'm along with a, a lot of scholars that say, you know, we shouldn't make too big of a deal about those words that kind of risks missing the point. And so here's the point. Remember that Peter denied Jesus three times. And John t makes a point of telling us that he did so by a charcoal fire. And now we have Jesus, they're all gathered around a charcoal fire having breakfast. And Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Now, you probably know this, that our emotions and our memories are often connected to our senses. So we can hear something and that can remind us of something else, or we can smell something and that reminds us of a memory. Or it may not elicit a particular memory, maybe it, oh, an emotion springs up. It could be good, it could be bad, it could be positive, it could be negative. And I think something like that is happening with Peter as he's sitting around that fire, that charcoal fire eating breakfast, almost certainly Peter was reliving his denial of Jesus, his, his thrice denial. Now, Jesus has taken Peter aside. I think it's important to say that, that Jesus doesn't ask uh, Peter these questions around everybody else. We don't really know that because we stopped at verse 19. Verse 20 makes a point of saying that as they were walking along, Peter turns and looks at the disciple whom Jesus loved, blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's clear that they had left that charcoal fire and were probably walking along the shore of, of the Sea of Galilee near the town of Tiberias. And Jesus asks these, these three questions that get to the heart of it all. Do you love me? So let's see what's going on here. This is a, this is a beautiful, beautiful exchange. N.T. Wright goes, as, goes so far as to say, this scene is one of the most spectacular interchanges in the whole Bible, perhaps all of literature. I don't know if I'd go that far, but it is pretty profound. Uh, the most remarkable thing is that by way of forgiveness, Peter is given a job to do. Jesus has, is commissioning Peter. So let's see, the first thing that Jesus does in this exchange is this is removing Peter's guilt. When you and I feel guilty, when people feel guilty today, there are several different things that we tend to do to deal with guilt that don't work too well. Uh, one of them is denial. We can pretend we deny it, we pretend it didn't happen, but just like with Peter, there are things that can happen that can resurrect, you know, the emotion and the feeling of, of guilt all over again. Or we tend to minimize it. It's no big deal, nobody's perfect, that kind of thing. Or we can compromise. We compromise it, that is, we lower our standards. 
What I'm getting at, I, got a, I had a fortune cookie a, while, a long time ago. Fortune cookie said, if you commit a sin twice, then it's no longer a sin. <laughs> you know, if you just keep doing it enough, uh, that it, it just doesn't seem that big of a deal. We blame others and we beat ourselves up. These are all the kind of things that we do. What does Jesus do? This is one of the things that makes this story so beautiful because Jesus confronts the sin, confronts the denial of Peter, but notice the way that he does it. He doesn't sit there and say, now, now Peter, you denied me three times. He doesn't have to. Just by asking the question three times, do you love me, and doing it after being around this charcoal fire, that's enough. I mean, that's, that's enough that, Pete, that Jesus is saying, you, you did it, Peter. You did it. And Peter's reliving it. Yeah, I did it. And, and that's important because forgiveness doesn't minimize, it doesn't deny, it doesn't pretend that sin didn't happen. It acknowledges it. In fact, it really has to in order for it to be forgiveness. So if you struggle with guilt, I think step one would be to acknowledge the source of the guilt and bring it to the cross of Jesus and confess it. And that's actually another thing that's going on here is Jesus is leading Peter through a sort of subversive confession. Subversive in the sense that Peter isn't saying, I confess to you, Lord, that I denied you, but rather is confessing in this threefold positive affirmation of I love you. Even as he's saying that three times, he's also saying, yeah, and I denied you three times. That's what, that's what John's trying to tell us in this, in this story. The second thing, and perhaps even more profound, is that Jesus heals Peter's shame. You need to, I think we need to understand there's a difference between conviction and condemnation slash shame. Condemnation and shame are two, two sides of the same coin. Conviction, conviction that, that comes from God. And it, it, it means you made a mistake. I made a mistake. It's just acknowledging the mistake. That's, that's conviction. Condemnation is you are a mistake. Uh, shame is, is accepting that as true and saying to yourself, I, I am a mistake. And that's, that's shame. And that's what's going on with Peter. The, the New Revised Standard Version lets us down at this point. In verse 17, the NRSV has Peter saying, says that Peter, uh, the third time that Jesus asked the question, Peter was hurt. Peter felt hurt. Now, I don't know what you hear when you hear the word hurt, but I, I kind of hear a little bit of trivializing of what's going on here, like Jesus hurt his feelings. But the, the Greek is severe grief. It, severe grief, very intense emotional pain. It's actually the same word that's used for the pain of childbirth. So something deeply painful is happening in Peter, and I think it's shame. The, the shame of having denied uh, Jesus, that shame probably coming in the sense of, I'm not worthy to be a disciple, I'm not worthy to be a follower of my Lord anymore. And all of that is just coming back, you know, that, that emotional avalanche uh, that, that is coming at him because of these questions that, are, that Jesus is asking. And how does Jesus deal with that? I think this is another part of the beautiful part of this story is that Jesus doesn't say, oh, well, okay, you know, it'll be, it'll be better. It's, Jesus says, well, feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Go feed my sheep. Now, here's the significance of that. Remember that Jesus is the king. Now, on the cross, he was a failed king. Anyone who was crucified, any, any would-be Messiah who was crucified, that was, that was no Messiah. 
But the resurrection vindicated him. And all the disciples know it. They are now in the presence of the Messiah with absolutely no doubt. And kings don't give traitors work to do. Right? Kings do not give traitors work to do. But that's exactly what Jesus does. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. That's how Jesus deals with the shame. You are my disciple. You are the rock upon which I'm going to build my church. None of that has changed. Let's get on with it. The king doesn't give traitors work to do. The king doesn't call people who are mistakes. He calls people who make mistakes. He calls imperfect people to reflect his perfect love and grace out into the world. So Jesus removes the guilt and heals the shame. And, and this is how it works for us, I think. Let's just think about it again. So you, Jesus removes the guilt and it happens by way of acknowledging the sin, not pretending it didn't happen, it, and, and, and admitting it, confessing it. And then when you do that, you know, if you're dealing with guilt, you confess it, you put it before Jesus on the cross, I did it, and Jesus says, well, do you love me? Yes, I love you. And if you're dealing with shame, then comes the next thing. And even if you're not dealing with shame, you're still going to get the next thing, and that is, feed my sheep. You are called. None of that has changed. To, to think that you are not worthy, to think that you are not good enough, is a lie. Yeah, you made a mistake. Or you can say, yes, I made a mistake. I let you down, Lord. I let myself down. I let other people down. Yeah. Do you love me? You know I love you. Feed my sheep. All of that, right then and there, is forgiveness and healing and commissioning. Sending out. And, you know, why does that work? You know, when I was in the South in the late 80s, in Selma, Alabama, there was a saying that we used to have, idle hands are the devil's playground. <laughs> right? Idle hands are the devil's playground. When you're not doing anything, then your, your mind has all the time in the world to think through all the stuff that you've done, to review and reflect on all your faults and failures, and Satan is going to be right there saying, see, you are a mistake. And even you know it. But when you're busy doing what the Lord has called you to do, you don't got time for that. Now, let's be clear about something. There's no magic here in this story with Jesus and Peter. It's not as if Jesus erased the memory of Peter's denial. I mean, almost certainly, any ne the next time that G Peter was at a charcoal fire, he remembered both the denial and his restoration. Right? It's not like the, the former never happened. It did, but he's restored. And the same with us. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Then feed my sheep. You know, in the kingdom of God... There are, there, there's, there are no players on the bench. Everyone is out there. There are no spectators in worship. Okay? There are no spectators in worship. We all have ministry to do. We have jobs to do. Are you doing it? And there are lots of ways... There are lots of different ways to do it. If you need some suggestions on ministries that you can do here at Christ Church, you can come and see me. You can come see Robert. Where's Marilyn? Go see Marilyn or Janelle or Evie. All kinds of stuff. There are, there, huh? 
Oh, well, Carolyn, of course. <laughs> you go to her before you go to me. <laughs> okay. There's work to be done. And that, that's, that's the great thing, is that we don't, I don't think we understand the honor it is to be told by the king, feed my sheep. The king has given us a job to do. The king forgives you, restores you. So now it's time to get to work. Amen.